Welcome to the Purdue Student Farm's uh, first uh, hemp planting. Um, it has been a very interesting season for me. I uh, intended to do uh, field research uh, with CBD hemp um, this summer. Um, the intention was to do everything open field. And uh, it just happened to be that uh, I had more than enough plants available uh, to put in this tunnel and the tunnel was available and uh, here we are. These same plants were planted on, the, on June 16 and uh, yeah that's about what seven eight weeks ago uh, from today and uh, the growth and the whole experience for me uh, was just phenomenal. I had an undergrad student Mitchell Ankney that uh, was assisting me uh, this summer he graduated in May and he still wanted to go on uh, doing a summer internship and um, he has a very keen interest uh, in hemp and um, we decided to, to tackle this and uh, like I said it was a really amazing experience. So what we did in the tunnel here um, as you see uh, we have 105 plants uh, in the tunnel uh, they are spaced four feet a pile a part in the row and we have uh, five rows of uh, uh, plants in the tunnel and uh, we were considering planting them five feet or even six feet apart uh, within the row but since we were a little bit later in the season uh, we thought it might be better uh, to increase the density a little bit and uh, as you can you can see now you know, they are, there's no more space in between plants. Um, so they filled up the entire space. And soon enough, as they go into flowering, um, you won't be able to see these uh, paths anymore. Uh, we used a drop tape uh, to irrigate. Um, they just planted in the ground uh, on a raised bed. These are quite heavy soils that we are working with here. And I must say, if that's the only takeaway from this entire experience, um, we know that cannabis um, doesn't like uh, a wet root zone and uh, looking at what's happening in the field compared to what's happening here in the high tunnel, um, that is certainly true. Here we can control our irrigation, um, our water amounts, there's no rain affecting the crop and uh, that is really a huge plus uh, for us. I can tell you that at our open field um, research plot, the plants are really just probably about a half, the, half the size uh, of these plants in, inside the tunnel. So that makes us very happy. I have to say I was never really a proponent of doing uh, hemp in the high tunnel. I in the past dis, uh, discouraged growers from uh, planting hemp um, in the high tunnel since your initial input cost is pretty high. But um, after seeing this and hopefully after we have weighed our uh, flower yield and all those kind of things, um, it would make total sense uh, to do it in here. Just looking at the growth we got, it is amazing and um, the potential that there is. Now, <clears throat> obviously what can contribute to the much larger bushes in the tunnel as well is because they are a little bit more stretched compared to in the field. Here we have a, a double layer plastic film in the structure and it takes out about 40% of uh, the radiation that we receive from the sun. Um, that still brings us to about uh, 1,400 micromoles um, of light, which is more than sufficient to, to grow this crop. Outside, you can go over 2,000 micromoles uh, pretty quickly. <clears throat> Nutrient-wise, the soil pH was a little bit high. It was around uh, 6.5. Um, as I said, it's a very uh, heavy clay soil and uh, soon after we transplanted our plants uh, we could clearly notice uh, some nutrient deficiencies uh, coming through on the leaves. We had to make quick adjustments and um, we used an acidifying uh, fertilizer um, and therefore we were using uh, fertilizer sources that contain more urea and ammonium uh, based uh, nitrogen and that helped us to quickly reduce the, 
the pH just in the root zone. Obviously that does not affect the entire uh, um, root zone or the entire raised bed um, in the tunnel and uh, that is something on, in the long term that we have to work on to get the, the pH down to um, at least 7. Um, for the rest of the growing season, uh, you know, we didn't really see a lot of uh, uh, deficiencies on the plants. Um, the only deficiency that we can see now, it started about a week ago or so, is a slight magnesium deficiency. And that could totally be attributed to the very high calcium content of the, um, of the soil. So we added some uh, magnesium sulfate to our uh, fertilizer blend and uh, that helped us to to stop the magnesium deficiency uh, so it doesn't progress any further. You won't see the deficiency disappear in the, the old growth but if you monitor the, the new growth that come out um, that um, that will tell you if you are managing the, um, the issue. Insect wise we did see a little bit of uh, white fly in the beginning of the season. They didn't really bother us. We didn't spray any, anything for it. We didn't see any uh, egg laying happening. So they were just bouncing around here and not really affecting the, the crop. We had a few grasshoppers, little grasshoppers bouncing around here. Uh, not much damage in that sense. And they were the occasional uh, semi-looper on the, on the leaves. Um, but yeah, so we are waiting to see what's going to happen during the, uh, the flowering phase. Um, usually there's some corn earworms um, that's attacking the, the flower. Um, hopefully that doesn't happen and the tunnel environment pro provides us a good uh, environment for, um, um, for the control of that um, just by having it in the tunnel. We will have to wait and see. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, so we should start um, harvesting this crop around the end of uh, September. Um, that will um, be ideal and uh, we will have to see what the effect of tunnel production uh, is in that sense, if the, the harvesting process is delayed or fast-tracked. I will elaborate a little bit more about this uh, in my uh, slideshow, uh, which will follow um, this video presentation and uh, you are more than welcome to reach out to us um, to ask for more information. I'm on a very steep learning curve here. I, I've never grown this crop before and uh, I find it fascinating. The crop really tells you pretty quickly when it's not happy uh, or when it is happy. Um, this is my uh, quick presentation I would like to do to you just to add on to some of those things that uh, I already talked about now. Um, so the clones were made on uh, May 13. Uh, we transferred them to uh, four inch pots about 20 days later. This is just to give you a little bit of a timeline. Uh, and we transplanted those four inch pots into the high tunnel on uh, June uh, 12, um, which added another 10 days. Um, we probably could have uh, transplanted those already about eight days, uh, you know, by June 10. Um, we had them in there for maybe just a little bit too long. Planted four feet apart in the row. We had five rows in the tunnel, three feet from the side of the tunnel, and then the rows were spaced um, uh, six feet uh, apart. And uh, as I said, we had a total of around five plants in the tunnel. Now, Mitchell already alluded to this, um, but this, this approach that we followed, I think, really works well especially in a situation where you have to uh, prolong the stay of the, the plant in, the, in your greenhouse. Um, these dates um, uh, just reflect uh, as where to these guys are in this stage. And I checked on the picture date, this kind of root development that we see here in the, the middle picture was exactly four days after we have put them in these little four inch pots. And if there's one thing I do have to emphasize that this plant is a very aggressive root developer. It, uh, it produces roots like uh, I've not seen on any other crop. And 
rightly so, as Mitchell has mentioned, you know, it gets root down so quickly and you have to be on top of it. This is probably the, the ideal time to get it out there in the field. You don't really want to wait for it to, to get fully uh, uh, rooted like uh, you see on the, the picture below. As soon as you can take it out of the pot without losing any of the substrate, um, you are in, uh, in good shape. Another thing uh, about this crop, it's very sensitive to root disease and it has to do with uh, over and under watering um, and obviously any pathogens that might be uh, in, in, uh, in your water source. In this case, it was most likely Pythium that came in, but you can see a very, very big difference between, between these two different plants and they came out of the same batch and uh, I think that's another thing that I do like about getting the, the plugs into a four inch pot is that you can really select your plant material well at the end before it actually goes into the tunnel, into the ground. So we did not plant anything that looked like this because chances are that uh, when the plant gets under stress, at some point in the tunnel, it will just die on you and uh, will not produce you any crop. So. Um, this kind of root ball that you see here is way too much. Uh, these plants were old already. Um, they will not really grow out of this ball. So like I said in the previous slide, rather having less roots, but a fully rooted uh, four inch pot. Um, and as soon as you can remove it without losing substrate, that plant is, uh, is ready to hit the field. So here's our layout. We, we just made the little ridges. Not that you probably needed a ridge, um, but this is a heavy clay soil. We use a drip tape with eight inch uh, spacing. Um, it's only because we had the tape. You can probably use something with 12 or 18 inch spacing as, as well, whatever works for you. Um, but what we have found is that this plant, because it's a scavenger, the roots just go everywhere. So in the end, the eight inch spacing on the drip tape really helped us because it kept a larger zone width and uh, you could really see the root uh, development throughout um, the raised bed. I'm going to give you a, a little bit of a time lapse uh, of the tunnel and it is just unbelievable how fast this crop is growing. This picture was taken at planting. This is one week later. We don't really see any uh, change there. Two weeks later, we can really see the plants are now uh, well established and they're starting to grow. Three weeks after planting, four weeks, five, and now you can see this plant is just skyrocketing. Six weeks, seven weeks, and this picture I took yesterday. So you can't see anything down the dials anymore. And uh, once this, uh, this plant starts uh, to initiate flowering, uh, which will probably uh, be around mid-August, uh, we're just waiting for that 14-hour light and 10-hour dark period. Um, and then they will uh, initiate flowering and then they probably will double in size. It's going to be a, a jungle in the tunnel. So we have to see how that uh, turns out. To compare that, this is our uh, plants um, at our mix uh, horticulture facility and uh, these plants are from the same batch. Um, they were planted uh, just a few days later. The item was planted on June 12. These were planted on June 15. And you can see the plants are much smaller. They've endured a lot of rain and the, the amount of rain we had the past two weeks really uh, hammered the crop, especially in this corner here um, at the back of your, uh, the field here on, your, on the right hand side of the slide. Um, it's a lot wetter out there. Um, so yeah, the plants are stockier, they more sturdy, and uh, it will be interesting to see how yields compare, but clearly we can irrigate in the tunnel according to our needs. And here it's uh, an inch or two inches of rain uh, per week. And we try to fertigate the plants out in the open field and it's very hard to fertigate anything that uh, is already sitting in saturated soil. So it's easier to do that in the, in the high tunnel uh, setup. This is basically what we followed. I mean, you can see here from the soil analysis, 
our pH in the tunnel was 7.7, .7, which is uh, a little bit too high. And immediately after we planted, we could see an issue uh, come up um, uh, in terms of nutrient uh, uptake. And we had to adjust that. And uh, that's why we used this uh, 2319 blend. There are many other commercial blends on the market now um, that are uh, tailor-made for um, cannabis uh, production. We just applied this once a week at a rate of 300 ppm nitrogen. And then for the past two weeks, you know, as you get closer to flower development, you don't want to put so much ammonium in there. Uh, we changed to this 15515, which um, has low uh, ammonium in there. And as Mitchell mentioned, the magnesium deficiency we had to take care of, and we are putting a little bit of magnesium sulfate in there. But it, again, if you look at the potassium, magnesium, and calcium uh, quantities in the soil here, and you listen to what Mitchell said about the potassium, calcium, magnesium ratio, our ratios are completely off there, even in the soil. And, and at this rate of calcium, where you have 4,000 ppm, it's very hard to adjust uh, your potassium to, <laughs> uh, to get to this uh, ideal ratio. So um, it might be easier to do that in a soil that as less calcium, but clearly that's why we are having uh, magnesium issues now. It's just an analysis of the two uh, fertilizer blends that we used, and you can see with the 2319, we had this ammonical nitrogen component, and that's what we used to to get the the pH down in the in the root zone area. And uh, it really is a short term solution, but we managed to to use that. Usually, when you look at the product label, you will see. Um, like here in the, the bottom left hand corner, the, they will tell you what the poten potential acidity or basicity of the product is. And um, this one has a, a good potential acidity uh, in it. So it will acidify the, the root zone sig um, significantly in that sense. Um, so the 15515 has very little, only 1.4% ammonical nitrogen, very little uh, urea in it. So all in all, the uh, ammonical N is uh, much less than in the 2319. Um, it has a little bit more magnesium in it, but it wasn't sufficient enough for us to eradicate the magnesium deficiency. And that's why we um, are applying additional magnesium sulfate. So irrigation wise, um, we irrigate once a week and it's, uh, it's pretty easy. I mean, our swells are uh, deeply uh, loosened and uh, that really helped for water to, to penetrate and roots to penetrate down there. And it is a heavy clay soil, so we do not have to irrigate this uh, crop too much. Ideally, uh, you would employ tensiometers and those kind of things to help you to, to uh, schedule. Um, we were more um, digging into the ground to see where um, or what our moisture content was like and uh, scheduled according to that. Um, as I mentioned, insects wasn't really an issue, and that's a big plus for us um, that we didn't have to spray anything thus far. Um, um, I mentioned flowering that will happen soon enough, and uh, our harvesting will probably probably be around the, the last week um, of September, first week of October, around about there. The other thing about this crop, especially in the form, a small farm situation, is the fact that uh, it's a very nice crop to inc include in your rotation, especially if you do tomatoes uh, and uh, peppers and those kind of sublimation crops in your tunnel and you want to schedule something else. It is a, a phytoremedial crop. It's a scavenger. It will take up anything it gets a uh, hold of um, and it can break uh, disease cycles uh, in that sense. But as I mentioned earlier, you can introduce perthium very easily with this. So that's um, a good reason to um, to keep unhealthy plants uh, away from the tunnel. So you can contact uh, me at any time um, and uh, we will see how uh, we can help you in that sense.